We put this property in our contract for $14,000 for 12 acres oh in my Florida. Gosh. We had it listed uh, and sold, I think, at like thirty five or 36000 So oh. after fees and everything, we you know more than doubled our money. What's cool about land investing is you can do it from anywhere. Like you don't have to go visit the property. You can do right. research online. You can send someone there. You can send an agent there. You can send a you know someone, a photographer, get drone shots, whatever you wanna do, you can pretty much do it remotely, which is why I love it. Hello friends. Today on the Real Estate Show from the Travel to Money podcast, we are talking about all the different types of real estate investing and some of them might surprise you. My name is Nicole and I'm joined by my co-host and real estate expert, Jeremy Resmer. Let's talk about different types of real estate investing. And let's maybe start by covering the ones that are more traditional. Like last week, we talked about flipping houses versus buying homes and turning them into rentals. I don't think we need to do a deep dive on that. I think those are pretty straightforward. What are a couple of other traditional forms of real estate investing? Mm, I mean, obviously, the majority of uh, people out there are probably going to start out flipping or buying rentals. So those are two biggies. There's also something else called um, wholesaling. Some people have probably heard of this. And then some people, um, you know, if you're not in the real estate scene, you don't really know. But basically what what happens is um, a wholesaler is someone who tries to market to the sellers to get them to sell. They agree to a price with a seller and then they turn around and will then assign their interest um, in the contract to a another flipper. And so what that might look like is maybe uh, a wholesaler agrees to a price with a seller for $100,000. And what that wholesaler is saying is I have both the ability and the intent to close on this property. And so being done the correct way, the wholesaler would, regardless when they sign that contract, they're gonna move forward with this property one way or another. But what the assignment allows um, a wholesaler to do is it gives them different options, exit strategies, basically. So for example, okay. for me, if I'm gonna buy a house, I might buy a house to flip it. I might buy a house to hold it as a rental property in my portfolio, or I might put a property in a contract and say, hey, you know what? This isn't really my sweet spot. Maybe it's not my favorite area. Maybe um, it's a little bit further out or maybe it needs too much work. And I'm like, you know what? I want someone else to take this property. So I can then assign my interest in the contract to another flipper who maybe they love that particular area or maybe they love doing flips that require a ton of work and <laughs> they would love to you know, be able to, to take this one on. And so maybe um, I assign it to them and that might be for you know, 105,000 or 110,000. And so the wholesaler gets that spread basically. And so I'm not flipping the house, I'm flipping the contract. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And so I'm able to then, you know, monetize that lead still, if you will, generate some income and then focus on, you know, reaching the next seller for another property. And so some people, that's all they do is they try to be that wholesaler, um, that sort of middle person, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then some people, they just do it as an additional exit strategy. And so that's how we operate our business. Okay. Um, so we operate our business in such a way where I want to have all options open to me. If I flip mm -hmm. it, if I wholesale it, or if I hold it as a rental, I want to have that complete control. And so once we see the property, then we're able to go and make that decision. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I th I've seen some YouTube ads actually about wholesaling recently, and that was the first time I'd really heard of it. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. You get it to kind of be the middleman. If I understand correctly, you don't have too much skin in the game. Like you're not the one really fronting the money for anything, but you get the difference of what you sell it for. So, right. Is, yeah, there, is there a lot of risk in it, it for the person in the middle or? So, so there's not a lot of risk over the last, probably I would say five years or so. The like national association of realtors has been cracking down because because like anything, like there's people that do it the right way. And when it's done the right way, it actually provides value, right? Because there's a lot of properties that they need a ton of work. 
maybe a listing agent is like, you know what, this house needs like $60,000. And they would tell the seller, hey, go do some work to it or fix this or do that. And there's a lot of situations where people just, whether they inherited a property or they just need to, you know, they're relocating, they need to move quickly, where a wholesaler or a flipper is, is, a, is a great solution, right? Because mm -hmm. they're able to buy quick, they pay with cash or hard money. Um, and so, you know, it's a quick, seamless transaction. You don't necessarily need to have an agent. But what's happening is there's some people in there who, um, some wholesalers who don't actually have the ability or the intent to actually close on the property. And so if that's their only exit strategy, what happens is they can put a seller in a jam because they mm -hmm. put something under contract and if they maybe put it under for too much money or they, you know, they really don't have a good deal or they can't actually assign the contract to somebody else for whatever reason, now all of a sudden, um, you know, they put that seller in a bad situation and they actually mm -hmm. didn't have the ability or the intent. And so that's now kind of infringing on what being an agent is, right? So right. when you're an agent, like you are a fiduciary and you have to work on behalf of, you know, your client. And so, you know, you're trying to match buyers and sellers. And so mm -hmm. some of these wholesalers are trying to join the party and basically say, hey, I don't have any money. I'm going to put something under contract for a low price and then I'm going to go and assign that and I'm going to make that spread. And basically they're acting as a as a broker or as an agent. So in that yeah. case, like this is that it's a kind of a fuzzy area and some states have actually crack down entirely on this and more mm -hmm. are, you know, working on different legislation. So I still think it's a great strategy, but um, it's one that, you know, a lot of people aren't nearly as familiar with. So that's been growing mm -hmm. quite a bit uh, lately mm -hmm. with wholesalers. And then also there's land investing. That's mm -hmm. something that um, has grown in popularity over the last couple of years. When I first started investing in land, it was about 2018. Nobody was doing it. People would look at you funny, like you're investing in land. Like, what are you doing? Are you developing it? No, I'm buying it cheap and I'm selling it cheap. I'm just, you know, land's land. It's out there. There's a lot of people who have never been to a piece of property before. They have no emotional mm -hmm. attachment. There's nothing there. It's in the middle of nowhere. And they're like, hey, I, you know, I just inherited this. I've never been there. I'm not going to go there. I just want to sell it. Or <laughs> Somehow, some way, they bought a piece of land in uh, in the desert of Arizona, and they're like, "Yeah, I thought I, this would be really cool a long time ago, but now you know plans change. I want to move down to Florida. Um, I'm not interested <laughs> in doing anything." And so, so there's all sorts of different reasons, um, you know, why people would sell a piece of land, but um, it's growing a lot in popularity. And so you have a lot of people who are developing land, sure but also people who are, you know, maybe they will buy and flip uh, rural vacant land or desert squares as they call them, or maybe their niche is finding lots along a lake, getting it for a good mm. price and then turning around and reselling it for a profit. So lots of different, lots of different ways to make money there as well. For the average person out there, you think of platforms like Zillow and realtor.com and maybe Redfin. How does someone like you find properties? I'm guessing you're not just like on these sites looking like how does someone get into it? How do you find out where the deals are? Is it just creative or what's that look like? So um, I think we talked about this last time about um, kind of getting a coach. It's interesting. There's so many niches in real estate. You know, if you watch TV, watch um, A&E or, you know, whatever channel it is that has all of the, you know, house flipping shows, like there's a lot of niches. And so yeah. you can flip houses, you can buy commercial buildings, office buildings, apartment buildings, you can invest alongside people where you just give your money. I mean, there's so many ways to invest. Um, but really, like when you dive into something like this, it really, it really makes a lot of sense to go talk to someone who's doing that exact thing. Can you go and find properties on Zillow? Um, in Redfin, like vacant land. Yeah, you can. Actually, um, it wouldn't be that difficult, but you have to go through a lot of different properties. It's a numbers game, right? So mm -hmm. let's say you want to invest in uh, vacant land in Ocala, Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. You could actually target specific zip codes. You can go to both Zillow or Redfin, and you could say, hey, um, I want land um, between one and five acres. So you could filter for that. You could say, mm -hmm. you know, I want something between this price range and this price range. 
maybe it's been on the market for, you know, three months or six months or whatever. So you can start filtering. But what happens is you're still dealing with mostly properties that are listed on the MLS. And so typically when someone lists a property with an agent, they're looking for top dollar. So mm -hmm. Does that mean that you can't buy land or a house on the MLS and get a good deal? It definitely does not mean that. However, you're going to have to go through a lot more properties, talk to a lot more people, make a lot more offers. And, you know, if you're low on funds and this is the best way for you to do it, I mean, it's just sweat, right? It's just calling people, mm -hmm. having conversations, making offers, and you will get deals. Mm -hmm. um, how we do it, how I do it, because this is what I do, you know, full time is I actually am looking for people who have not yet listed it, right? Because mm -hmm. when you work with an agent, sure, you want top dollar, but typically when you're gonna list something full price, especially land, it's gonna take typically longer to sell, right? Because if somebody's looking for a piece of property, like they're looking for a deal typically. Mm -hmm. And so someone's like, well, shoot, I can get six acres here, but I can get six acres over here. It's a difference of $10,000. A lot of times people are price sensitive. I want to find people before they ever get with a, a realtor. So that way I can just give them a cash offer if they want to close in 60 days or one week or whatever that is. Like I can negotiate on my terms because sometimes I need to do due diligence, right? Um, do they have utilities on the property? Has a house ever been there? Was it a manufactured home? If so, there's utilities. Now it's worth more. Like I have all these questions that I need to kind of work through and figure out, okay, what's, what's the appropriate value? And so if I can have that discussion directly with the seller, now mm -hmm. I can sort of craft what they're looking for because sometimes they don't want to have mm -hmm. to pay taxes if I pay full price. Um, so maybe they'll say, Hey, I'll take 10,000 now and I'll take 10,000 next year. And I'll take 10,000 the year after for a total oh. of 30,000. If I can have that discussion directly with a seller, I can mm -hmm. go through all the different options and I can craft different offers that would work best based on their situation. And so typically if a house is listed, it's really straightforward and it's like, Hey, this is, you know, this is what we're, we're asking for it. And so you don't get to be as creative. And so right. I, I just, I like to go and, and find those individuals. And so there's actually websites out there that that's all they do is they provide data. And so you could actually go in and say, Hey, I want to find people that live in Ocala in these two zip codes and they own properties from let's call it five to 10 acres. And there's no, no structures there. There's no square footage, right? You can start to build your filter filters essentially. And so then they'll give you a list, you pay for that list. And now you can actually send mail to them. You could send them a postcard and say, Hey, I want to buy your land. Or what we do in the land business is we send blind offers where we scrub the data. We mm -hmm. figure out um, based on, um, you know, other sold properties, what they sold for in that area. And we just go and we make blind offers and tell wow. people, hey, we'll buy your property for this price. And sometimes we don't even talk to a seller. Sometimes they'll <laughs> send back the offer, they'll sign it, and then we get it in the mail and they don't even wanna talk. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they'll email it back, sometimes they'll text us with a picture of it, and we'll try to talk to them, call them, text them, and they're just like, yeah, I don't wanna talk, I just want to uh, you know, just go do your thing, and then when we're ready to close, let me know. So. So I can talk for days about some crazy situations, but there was actually one property in Florida. It was not far from Tallahassee. It was 12 acres. There used to be a manufactured home on the property. Uh, they mm -hmm. had a pole barn that got damaged in a, in a hurricane. And we, we put that property under contract. This is crazy. We put this property under contract for $14,000 for 12 acres oh in Florida. Oh my gosh. And... <laughs> they already had, like I said, they had a manufactured home. It was um, removed. So the utilities were there. Um, and there was even a place carved out where that house was. It was like a one acre area where the land was a little bit mm. more cleared. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, I kind of like, I knew it was a good deal. So I'm like, yeah, I'll buy it. I didn't do any research. So this is not the right way to buy land, but I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's a really good deal. Um, so let's just go and put it under contract. And so when I closed on it, I'm like, oh shoot, I guess I have to call an agent. Like, I got to figure out what this thing's even worth. So uh, the agent says to me, well, you know, this property has this, it has that. I'm sure you already know that. And I'm like, ma'am, 
with all due respect, I don't know anything about this property. <laughs> I just know I got a good deal and I've actually been sitting on it for, I don't know, a month and a half. I figured I'd get to it when I get to it. And, um, you know, this is not really the way I like to do business, but I'm like, what do you recommend I do? So she said, well, I went out with my husband and um, he is a contractor and she's like, that pole barn could be repaired. So she's like, that's not really that big of an expense. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, my mower, my guy, you know, my lawn maintenance company, whatever. I'll send mm -hmm. them out there. We'll mow that acre of the property so it's cleared, give people a vision of what they would be buying. And she's like, your land's probably worth like 55000 But she's <laughs> like, I mean, what do you want to do with it? I'm like, well, I mean, I'd like to sell it quick. How I buy land is I buy cheap and I sell cheap. Um, because you know, velocity of money, right? Like how quickly mm -hmm. can I turn over my money and then reinvest it into something else? So there's some people who would say, oh, well, I'm just going to sit for the full 55,000. Well, that's not how we do it in the land business, at least not, you know, our company. I told the agent, I said, Hey, I want this thing under contract within 30 days, 60 at the most. So she said, okay, here's what we're going to do. It's worth 55,000. We're going to list it at 39.9. And she's like, we'll move it pretty quick. So then she found out after it listed that it was actually in a um, part of the property was in like a, oh shoot, I don't want to call it wetlands, but some sort of preserve. And so of okay. course I did, I did no due diligence. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> you got she's, some like swamp. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. she's like, did you know this and this? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm like, I didn't know any of that. And she's like, well, so here's the thing. It's not really going to hurt us, but I have to disclose it. And some people aren't going to want that. But she's like, I don't really think it's a big deal. It's not going to affect your value. I'm like, okay, do whatever you got to do. Like, this is how I handled this particular property. And mm -hmm. partly because I just, I knew it was a good deal. I was able to see everything from the map. And so what's cool about land investing is you can do it from anywhere. Like you don't have to go visit the property. You can do right. research online. You can send someone there. You can send an agent there. You can send a, you know, someone, a photographer, get drone shots, whatever you want to do. You can pretty much do it remotely, which is why I love it. And so back to the story, this lady finally <laughs> gets in our contract. We had it listed uh, and sold, I think at like 35 or 36,000. So wow. after fees and everything, we, you know, more than doubled our money. And wow. so- so that's an example of a land deal where if you have direct access to the seller, in fact, what's crazy is the seller came to us and we were like, no, we're not really interested in the property. And then like three months later, I think our follow-up, like someone on my team reached out to them or maybe they got a text message or something and they replied and we looked at the property again. And for whatever reason, maybe the price was lower or maybe we mm -hmm. just were like, hey, yeah, we're interested now. But um, at the end of the day, we you know more than doubled our money. We paid 14000 for the property and we walked away with somewhere close to like 30,000, um, you know, after fees. So, you know, we doubled our money there pretty close. So it's pretty good. And what was the timeline again from start to finish? So the longest part of it was me holding the property and not actually contacting anyone about it. <laughs> so, but from the time we bought it, I think we sat on it like 30 or 45 days and you know, my team is like, Hey, are we going to move this property? I'm like, yeah, we should. So then I reached out to an agent and then she had it sold in like, from the time we listed it to money in the bank, it was like 28 days. It was fast. Oh my gosh. You're making a hundred percent profits there on, in like a couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. And, Which, and that's, that's, that's not uncommon. Wild. I mean, it, it, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. And so we look for land that, you know, maybe people don't want, or it's outside the beaten path. But mm -hmm. again, like if you want to invest in lake lots and flip those, you can, if you want to, um, invest in, uh, lots that are, you know, in Orlando or in Nashville, um, that mm -hmm. are ready to be developed. Yes. You're going to pay more for them, but there's opportunities for that too. So there's so many niches within just the land business, just like with right. houses, you can mm -hmm. you can really go and and figure out what works best for your lifestyle, what you want to do, how much you can afford. I mean, you could buy little desert parcels in Arizona and pay like two hundred bucks for like a ten acre parcel. Wow! And it's like, well, <laughs> how is that even possible? And then you turn around and you're like, well, I don't have a lot of money, but I can start with a couple hundred bucks. And then maybe you turn around and you sell it for like six or eight hundred dollars. So right, there's, there's so many wow. different things you can do, but it's pretty gnarly. I want to keep asking more questions about that, but I'll keep us moving and we'll do a whole land episode sure. at some point. Sure. Um, so one of the things I really love about investing in real estate is that every deal is different, like you've been talking about. And that 
really allows for so much creativity. And speaking of creativity, what are maybe some less traditional forms of real estate investing other than what we've covered? Maybe anything else that comes to mind? Again, it just depends on what your appetite is, what your experience is. Um, like I know some people that they skip houses altogether and they want to go right to apartments or, mm. or maybe they don't like they have a W2 um, and they don't actually want to be the guy that's going out, talking to sellers, dealing with um, maintenance guys, uh, renovating properties. They want none of that, but they want the benefits of real estate. Maybe they want the depreciation um, and they want someone else. That's what we would call a trusted operator to go and handle all of that for them. And they want their money to generate a good return. So mm -hmm. um, I know some people that invest in real estate syndications. So mm -hmm. um, basically people, investors are, you know, who are going and finding the deals, they're negotiating them. And then once they have them under contract, then they're trying to pool together money from other investors. So now you've got multiple investors partnered together in a particular deal. And so okay. for me, I actually just invested in one that closed, I think it was yesterday and it was here in the, oh. the Nashville area. And mm -hmm. so um, typically they require you to to put bigger chunks of money down. But I know some where you can put as little as like ten thousand dollars in and then some of them will require more. They'll they'll say, hey, you got to put one hundred thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. you'll want to find someone that, you know, kind of fits, you know, the amount of money that you have, which you're you're, you're looking to spend. But basically yeah. you get the depreciation, you get tax benefits, they'll give you a preferred return. So you might give them, let's say, fifty thousand dollars and then you might get a seven to nine percent preferred return. So you're getting that back each year. Year. And mm -hmm. then they're working to stabilize the asset, right? Increase rents, um, you know, maybe do improvements, do whatever it is they're trying to do. They're following a business plan. And then typically within three to seven years, they will refinance or they will sell that asset. And then, you know, you're going to get a nice return. So that's cool to know that you don't have to have enough money to like go buy a whole house to get started in real estate investing, but you yep. can start with smaller chunks of money through these various ways. And I, I think what you just mentioned might be a good way for people to kind of get their, get their toes wet, you know, yeah, um, yeah for sure, kind of for get sure. started. And, yeah. And another, so one example of that is, um, so let's say you invested uh, $50,000 into a deal, into a syndication. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe there's a projected 20% annualized return. So what mm -hmm. that would look like, let's say you're in it for five years, you're going to double mm -hmm. your money. So right. what some people like to do, again, it depends on, you know, your financial situation and, you know, what your goals are. But I know some guys that they like to invest $50,000 once a year into a different syndication. And so if okay. you have that kind of money to invest, what they're doing is they're staggering their investment into another deal typically with another operator, right? Because you don't want all your eggs in one basket. Um, mm -hmm. It's good to have, you know, to, to, to interview these guys, to understand what their business looks like, see that there's a track record, make sure they know what they're doing and have been around for a long time. But to be able to put, let's say you're going to do 50,000 one year, 50,000 the next year. So you're, you're basically staggering your investment. You're getting the uh, depreciation benefits. You're able to uh, reduce your taxes and, you know, if you're investing in the right syndications, I mean, you might truly get a 20 plus annualized return. And so in, let's say five years, that uh, 50,000 now comes back at a hundred. The year two, you have another one that is coming back, right? Um, mm -hmm. Again, assuming that it works perfectly in five year intervals. Sure. But so there's people who are creating a whole nother income stream from these investments and they're minimizing their taxes based on their situation. So man, you wow. can go into this. It's a whole nother topic, but yeah. you know, it's, it's really cool. There's a lot of things you can do with real estate, a lot of ways to get involved. Let me tell you uh, what my, a friend of my dad's did, and you can tell me if you've ever heard of this. Um, I thought this was really creative and certain people could probably take advantage of it in a not so great way. But I think if if your heart is kind of right in it, 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 it made a lot of sense to me. So there are a lot of older people who own their homes, but they can't afford to maintain them. And in many situations, they don't have anyone like a child that they're leaving the home to. So this guy that my dad knew would go have a conversation with that person, kind of like, you, you know, talking to the person directly. He would offer to buy their house in cash 
at a very low price in comparison to what the home is worth. I'm going to make these numbers up, but let's just say he would offer them $50,000 for a house that's worth $150,000. I'm not sure, but let's just use that hypothetically. He would say to them, I'll give you the cash for the house, which you can use to live off of. As long as you live, you can continue living in the house free of charge. I will also do all of the maintenance for the house. You have a leak you haven't been able to fix. I'll take care of that. Whatever the issues are, I'll make sure everything in the house is up to standard. So it's like a win-win for both of them. They have a better quality of life for their remaining years and he gets an amazing deal on a home. He's just going to have to wait 5, 10, 15 years or maybe more to see the gains. But he also knows the property will only become more valuable. My dad asked him, isn't it kind of weird? Like your best financial interest is when they have died, which feels a little awkward. But he was like, no, I want them to live for as long as they can. The property only becomes more valuable over time and I'm happy for them to live well. It seemed really creative to me. Uh, my fear would be that someone who doesn't care about the humanity of those people and is more so preying on them because they're vulnerable could also take the same approach. But have you ever heard of this type of investing before? Or yes. So I've had people that say, do, do not do this. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found in investing is that a lot of times when people come to a company like ours, they're looking for some sort of creative solution, right? Because real mm -hmm. estate's actually the problem. You could say, well, mm -hmm. how is real estate a problem? Well, I'll tell you how real estate is a problem. Maybe, um, you know, uh, a spouse passed away and the house is too big. Kids are moved out. They live out of state. They can't maintain it. There's too much work. It's too big. And they're like, you know mm -hmm. what? Like, I, I want to stay in the area or I'd love to stay in this house and not have to worry about all of that. And so there's all these different scenarios where maybe an agent's going to say, hey, you know, you've got a lot of work that needs to be done here in order for us to sell it um, mm -hmm. or whatever that situation is. And so when they come to someone like us, we're like, OK, we're we're I'm asking a lot of questions. Right. Mm -hmm. well, where are you going to go? Are you going to move on a state? Are you going to stay in the area? Are you going to rent? Do you want to buy? Like that's, that's my job is to understand really like what's your motivation for selling, right? And so I'll ask the right. question like, have you talked to anybody else? Have you talked to an agent? Have you talked to family members? You know, do you have mm -hmm. any kids that they have a stake in this or anyone that um, is helping you to make that decision, right? Who are the decision makers and like, what are you trying to, to, to get out of this? And so I always want to ask, like, who have you talked to? And and also, like, why are you calling me? Right. Because mm -hmm. have you thought about keeping it as a rental? Right. Just converting it. Or have you thought about, you know, listing it with an agent? You know, why haven't you done that? Right. So when right. you start asking those questions and you have to be compassionate because sometimes the answers are are difficult. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're not. Sometimes they're really <laughs> straightforward. I just don't want to work with an agent. Hey, I just don't want to pay commissions. Mm -hmm. And so that's fine. But a lot of times people actually have real problems that um, that gets uncovered and real estate is a problem. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to talk through their situation and then craft an offer that works best for them. And so I actually have mm -hmm. three properties in, um, done in a way, well, four actually, now that I think about it, um, four that we own in a way that you mentioned. Now it's a little okay. bit different because, so I have not actually uh, purchased their house and then said, Hey, you can live in it without paying any rent. Right. Um, what we'll do is either we've reduced the rent or like sometimes we've bought these properties, we've kept their mortgage in place again, a okay. whole nother topic, but we mm -hmm. can buy someone's property and we actually own it and we mm -hmm. are now taking over the mortgage payment. And so right. they, we have some of these situations where the people are like, Hey, I don't want to move out, but I can't make the payment. Okay. If I sell it to you, and so there's a due on sale clause and mm -hmm. uh, banks have the uh, right, if they choose to, to call the note due. But a lot mm -hmm. of times banks are like, hey, we have a performing note. We're getting our money. They're not necessarily um, trying to you know, be in the business of calling notes and mm -hmm. having to go through all the legal, legal process and all that. And so we'll buy someone's house and you know, work something out. Maybe it's a discounted um, rent or maybe they're actually paying more rent, but now we've just put, you know, $100,000 in their pocket that they can use that to live off of. Or sometimes it's just a gap, right? They're like, hey, mm -hmm. I got social security kicking in in eight months. Right now things are really hard. Um, my kids don't want the house. 
I want to live here till I die. Can we work mm -hmm. something out where you buy it? I pay rent. It's this amount. And, you know, any additional equity or anything when I pass away, you know, you now own the house and either there's a mortgage on it or we've already put it into our our name and with our own uh, mortgage and they're just a tenant. Like there's there's different ways to do this, but we've done it at least four times that I can think of right now. Maybe we have more and we've got those people still living there. Um, they're still mm -hmm. paying rent. And so the, the challenge is if someone had to sell originally because they didn't have the ability to pay rent and they were in pre foreclosure, mm -hmm. now you got to be really careful because if they couldn't pay before, what's the right. likelihood that they're going to be able to pay when you now own the house, right? So now <laughs> you've got yourself a problem that may not be worth it. So when we've sure. done these situations, it was very specific. It wasn't necessarily because of a financial crisis. It was more, hey, I want to sell the house. I don't want to create a problem for my kids when I pass, but I still want to live here. And can mm -hmm. you help me work through this? And so, yeah, we've done that several times. And I think that's a great way to do it because everybody wins. And as long mm -hmm. as we're able to um, make it where, you know, the seller's getting what they want and we're at least able to, to cover, um, you know, our rent or our mortgage payment or whatever, then that's fine. You know, we don't have to you right. know, gouge anybody. We don't have to mm -hmm. jack up rents. Like we can actually take a much reduced rent and, you know, still work for everybody. So yeah, that's what yeah. We'd, be, we'd be aiming for. That makes a lot of sense. And I really like that you mentioned being compassionate because I feel like sometimes that's what's missing for people. And they probably feel that too, when you're really trying to hear them and you can gain a lot of trust that way. Let's talk about commercial real estate for a sec. This seems to be the area that's going to be crashing. I keep hearing people talking about this brick and mortar is not in anymore. And especially after the switch to remote work, many buildings all over the country are sitting empty. Uh, people are going to be able to pick up these buildings for pennies on the dollar from what I'm understanding. But is that a good investment? What are people going to be doing with these buildings? Do you know much about commercial real estate or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so there's the commercial like office, right? So mm -hmm. that's probably what you're referring to. Um, yeah. Cause I follow this really closely. I have some uh, buddies that they invest in office buildings or um, convenience stores or other things. And so, and then apartments would be considered commercial as well. Right. So anything five units plus is considered a, mm -hmm. a commercial property. Um, I'm actually putting one under contract, a convenience store, hopefully on Tuesday after the new <laughs> year. Um, but that's not really my sweet spot per se. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is definitely a huge opportunity. And so I think the more you invest in real estate, the more you realize that when everyone else is fearful, that's when we should be greedy. Um, <laughs> put in a different way, um, when everyone else is selling, that's when I'm looking to buy, right? And when everyone is buying, because because it's crazy, right? Because um, you know during the the global financial crisis leading up to that, and even just recently in the last several months, you know, doctors are like, oh yeah, I'm flipping a house, or um, you know, hairstylists are like, oh yeah, I'm getting into real estate, and it's like, okay, this is a little bit crazy because when everybody's talking about how they can't lose or how everybody's a flipper or that's the time where I'm like, wait a second, I need to rethink this a little bit. Um, I need yeah. to be a little bit more careful. Um, and so, you know, maybe at that point when everyone's buying, I'm selling, or maybe I'm looking for that person and saying, Hey, that person's just getting started. I've got a property for you to buy. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, I think it's, um, it's one of those things where for office, there is going to be some pain. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. overnight. It's probably going to take one to three years for it to really be felt. Because as, as companies whose teams have not gone back to the office, when it's time for them to renew, they're not going to. And so immediately mm -hmm. you're going to have vacancies there. And, and there's going to be some real, there's going to be some real pain for sure. But if you're an investor who knows that space well and knows what, what will work and knows, you know, if something is in a really good area or what type of tenants would be ideal. If you're in that space, there's a huge opportunity. And so um, I always want to be a little bit careful because if you're inexperienced, then that might be a time for you to get involved, but make sure you're working with someone that knows what they're doing. 
Right. Um, so I think there's great opportunities. There will be great opportunities in commercial, um, mm-hmm. but you have to buy right. If you get in and you're just like, oh yeah, this is going to be a great deal. I'm getting this, you know, smoking deal on a property, and you think, oh, yeah, I'm getting a, you know, hundred thousand dollars off the, you know, the, the asking price. Maybe you should have got four, five, six, eight hundred thousand dollars off the asking price because once you buy that, you may not be able to lease that up. So, again, without going into all the details, there will be great opportunities, but you really have to know your numbers um, in order to 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 you know to make it uh, a successful investment or be working with someone that does. Right. This is just kind of a question along the lines of commercial real estate, and I don't understand a lot about it at all, but with all of the opportunity in commercial real estate, is there any chance that any of that gets turned into apartment buildings or yes. things like that? How does that yeah, work? No, that's great. I, I actually, um, I wanted to hit on that. I was just going past uh, a mall. It was an old Macy's and Amazon mm-hmm. converted it to like a, like a, like a store, a shipping, oh, a shipping like a store. warehouse. Yeah. 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 Um, So there's definitely some of that that's going on. And I think more of that will continue. Um, A lot of it's going to be location, right? So, I mean, if there's certain companies that are moving out of the city, I mean, cities oftentimes are looking for great like loft space or, um, you know, uh, housing in great locations. So Mm -hmm. uh, I know several investors who are doing um, hotel conversions. They're converting okay. hotels to to multifamily. Um, I know some folks who are taking properties that were formerly office or retail, and they're mm-hmm. converting them to mixed use or to um, to multifamily. So yeah, there's definitely going to be some of that going on. Some of it's already happening. There's a lot mm-hmm. of investors who have just you know jumped uh, headfirst right into that space and learned it, mm-hmm. and they're doing really well. So yeah, there's great opportunities there. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities across the board. But it's going to require someone with a vision and someone that really knows how to how to get that done, right? Because you've got rezoning that may be uh, required. That's what I was going to ask about rezoning, because yep. that's not always super easy, I'd imagine. You have to work yep. with the local governments to get that sorted. Yep. Uh, rezoning, there might be environmental um, things that need to get done. So, I mean, it's really, again, like there's people that do this stuff. A, a great entry point for something like this is if you want to do multifamily, go talk to some multifamily investors or syndicators, people who have hundreds and thousands of units under management Mm -hmm. and they're the operator and they can tell you all about multifamily. And if they have opportunities to get involved, one of the best ways to learn is to invest in their syndication So now Mm -hmm. you have access to them because they're like, well, shoot, you know, I need to keep my investors happy. I want to keep them in the loop. And so they'll give you updates. They'll give you updates about where you're at as far as, hey, we're about to close. Hey, we just closed uh, 30 days ago. Here's where our leases, our lease ups look like. They can give you um, information about the um, the construction, renovations, Mm -hmm. where we're at as part of, you know, according to our plan. And so you can now ask specific questions. You can actually go meet them at their office. And a lot of times they encourage this. And so I've seen so many investors who got involved passively to then go and start learning how it's done on the active management side. Mm -hmm. And so if it's right for them, now they're able to then maybe get involved the next time or maybe a year or two years down the road where they're now a part of the what they call general partnership. They're part Mm -hmm. of the active management in that in that asset. So there's so many ways to get involved in this, but that's a great way to get started, to learn the ropes, and then to be able to um, partner alongside others who um, have already done this. And then that's a fast way to learn and make money at the same time. So That's fantastic. I hadn't thought about that, but that was one of the things that's been rolling around in my head is, How do I get from where I am? Maybe not to where you are, not like a full on real estate business, but like, how do I get in and learn behind someone? And so that that makes a lot of sense. I love that. Love that. Well, I feel like a lot of the investment people I follow, rather than investing directly in real estate, they choose to invest in REITs. For those of you listening, if you're not familiar with REITs, it stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. It's just a way to invest in real estate via the stock market. Jeremy, do you know much about REITs? It seems like a good way to have some skin in the game when it comes to real estate investing without really having to know too much. Is that kind of like the easy way to put your money in real estate 
Or what do you think of it? Um, it is. Um, it's just a different way to invest. You're you're giving up control. You're mm-hmm. basically investing your money and you're looking to get, in a lot of instances, a dividend or some mm-hmm. sort of return. Again, it just depends on what you're looking for. I personally like investing in, if I'm going to go that route, I would rather have my money in a syndication. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because in a syndication, it could be a, a pool of single family houses, maybe a hundred houses, or maybe... Maybe it's a multifamily apartment building. I like that because I have a little bit more control. I'm considered a limited partner. And even though mm-hmm. I'm not actively managing that property, um, I have direct access with the general partners, the guys who are actively managing that. And so I can get FaceTime. I can ask them specific questions. I'm probably going to get better returns. I'm probably going to get a 7 to 9% preferred return annually. And then I'm going to get you know up to 20% maybe, or higher on my annualized return. And I get depreciation benefits. And so if I look at everything in totality, I like the benefits that come from a syndication. Again, assuming Mm -hmm. it's a great asset, it's conservatively underwritten by a strong uh, asset manager, then that's great. If you just are looking to, you know, invest in or maybe diversify and have some exposure to real estate, yeah, REITs are fine. I'm not ever going to say, hey, yeah, don't do it because everyone's a little bit different. They have a different risk tolerance and maybe they want to be, you know, even less involved or less in control. Um, and so typically the the big companies that are running the REITs are like the, the Black Rocks and the, you know, the big hedge funds. And those are fine. They're just, you know they're not for everybody. So right. for me personally, I'm not looking there because I can get better returns in my own investments or with other investors. And so I'm looking to get the highest return with the lowest amount of risk. And because I'm already in that industry for for my for for me, there's there's other ways I can get, you know, I can reach my objectives better. But for someone that's just right. looking to get started, I would say, yeah, look at it just like anything else, but make sure you you fully understand it and talk with enough people to see what the benefits and and, um, you know, disadvantages are. Yeah. And speaking of getting started investing with different folks, I've seen you open up to investors before. Is that something you're doing now? Can people invest with you or your business now? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I've taken um I've taken a little bit of a measured approach with this. Um a couple of years ago, I was planning to really go hard into multifamily and syndication <laughs> and um that was something that I was looking to do. So I was bringing on some investors, but what I wanted to make sure of when I started was Number one, if I've got friends and family, if I have their money, I'm actually more concerned or more conservative with their money than I am mine because I Mm. never want to lose money. And so Mm. what I first started, number one, they had to feel me out and know like, hey, what what is what is your you know, what does your model look like? How are you making money? How do I make money? Um, And so I focused on smaller deals, but I had an eye for the the long term because if I did a small land deal, maybe I needed $10,000 to close a deal. And my projection was, hey, we're going to sell this for twenty dollars to $30,000, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. I would tell them $20,000, but I know there's upside there. So if we beat that, then you know, everybody wins and we're over delivering. And so actually that's what happened on several of my first deals. And one of them was a land deal. Um, I bought an apartment building that the investor actually didn't want any of the equity. Okay. Mm. And so he wanted to just give me a loan. And so I gave him 12% interest on his money annualized. Mm -hmm. And after he saw how well I did on that property, he said, next time I want some of the equity. And I said, Hey, (laughs) this is where the money's at. This is where you should be investing. I offered that to him. So I was doing it a lot more previously, but our business Mm -hmm. has grown so much that I'm, I'm not as, as actively looking for new capital. Although I probably should (laughs) because, um, it's, it's, it's available and people are looking to you know, put their money somewhere else beside the stock market. But yeah, yeah, if someone was interested, they could reach out to me and I'd be happy to share some of the opportunities we have. We're primarily focusing right now on land deals. You know, what we would do is we, you know, put a property under contract, we buy it, we would use your money. So you would send Mm -hmm. us the funds 
And then we turn around and do all the work, do any prep, um, work with the agents, do whatever needs to be done to get it sold. Once the property sells, then you get paid out your return. So those returns are really good. Um, in fact, we used to do them at 50%, but we don't, we're not as generous anymore. So, um, but still it's a great way to get an awesome return. And so we've done that both with apartments and with um, land deals. So. If anyone's right. interested, they can certainly reach out to me. That's awesome. I might have to send some money your way. <laughs> well, Jeremy, I continue to be excited about chatting with you every week. We've barely gotten started and I'm learning so much. Um, for those of you listening, check back next week where we are going to be talking about uh, do you invest at home or do you invest abroad? And that's somewhere where I have a little bit of experience. So we'll be chatting about that and we hope you join us. If you haven't seen our first two episodes about real estate, check those out and subscribe to join us every week. I can't wait to see where your dreams will take you.